issue, and some vendors aren't, you know, and so I just want to, you know, make this point very, very specifically that, you know, you can't just lump in all vendors in one category. Similarly, you can't lump all, you know, finders in one category either. So there's a lot of nuances here that I think are being, uh, you know, um, it, it's almost like a, a, what is it, a caricature that's being painted here. And it, that's, that's absolutely not the appropriate way to, to view these things. One more point, because y'all have had the mics for a very long time, so <laughs> give, me, give me a minute here. Um, <laughs> One more point, you know, is that, uh, yeah, um, I, another big thing is there's a lot of assumptions about what went on, you know, with, with that particular issue or any particular issue. And the fact of the matter is um, I, I hear that there, there's just a need for more transparency, more communication, more coordination. That's exactly what we want, right? So I think that's what we want across the board. And we can work towards that together. Okay. Now you can help it out. I just wanted to say I agree. Okay. Thank you. <laughs> so, um, well, actually, I think that there's, uh, I can see both sides of the of the argument, and uh, as long as we are talking about, I, I mean, I think that it's easy, it's an easy discussion, it's an easy argument, when we are talking about evidently critical vulnerabilities threatening an infrastructure. So, we are talking about a very pervasive vulnerability in ATM systems. And then- That was just an example, and though. Yeah, I know, I know but it's- enough. Well, well th that's, that's, an, that's another critical, uh, I, mean, I mean, even more critical uh, example. And I think that these examples are actually, uh, you know, pretty, pretty easy to get people to agree upon. Because um, with some few exceptions, uh, no one really wants to see the DNS infrastructure crash and burn, right? So um, I, I think that everyone would agree that uh, what what then coordinated was a, an extraordinary effort, uh, be, and I I I would not I would not know who could uh, you know advocate a different handling of that of that type of vulnerability. Yeah, differences in details, but uh, in general, uh, I I don't I don't think that anybody would anybody sane would advocate publicly disclosing a vulnerability without trying to coordinate a response on such a critical well, system. Somebody did. So, yeah. So, I, I, so that's another point, though. One, one quick How quick? No, I'm teasing. Yeah. Go ahead. No, it's, yeah, it's very welcome. Uh, just, to, <laughs> just, just to say, you know, that, that disclosure went very well, and there's a lot of excellent coordination, and it was built on the backs of, you know, 10 years of experience. I mean, this is a community of people that have all had to fix a lot of bugs. <laughs> and if, uh, if there hadn't been that experience, it would have been a, a much harder thing. So, you know, yes, that went well, but it wasn't like a, a shot in the dark that came out of nowhere. Like, yeah. this is part of a series of, of very good work. Yeah. And that's an excellent point. That brings me to the next point of point in time anything, right? So let's just, stupid simple, not even related to you know, responsible disclosure. We're talking about, you know, pen, pen testing, vulnerability assessments. We all know those, those are point in time, right? You run it, you get your scan, you're like, oh, wow, I need to fix this. It's red, yellow, green, whatever, right? At the end of the day, though, once that scan is run, how meaningful is it really? It might be meaningful for trending and analysis, and my better one, I run it next month, or is my security parameters worse? But at the end of the day, point in time doesn't work anymore. We need near real time of just about everything and anything, especially now that we're moving to the virtualization, cloud platform, hands off, remote, around the world, you name it. So the point is, when we were talking about how long would you wait, and someone mentioned it, and remember what the exact reference was, but you know, how long was someone willing to wait, or when's the proper time? And I think about certain things like, how many of you would wait in line in Starbucks for like 30 minutes to get their triple venti non-fat latte? Oh yeah, that line's out the door, but I know I'm gonna get that coffee, and all right, I'm willing to wait for it. That's a different kind of a patient wait category, if you will. Take it to the technology side of the house when we're saying, I want it fast, I want it furious, I told you there was a bug, I told you to fix it, you didn't do it, boom, I'm exploiting. I think that's the point where we're gonna start to get to when we're talking about responsible disclosure. Is it even worth saying, hey, there's a problem, knowing we have this year two, 10 year lag or a research and development project that we have to do to get to a point to fix it, right? So, so really, 
what's the reality of the future? Not even today. We know we have issues with responsible disclosure, whether it's too fully disclosed or time to, time to fix or time to address, whatever. Where do you think the future state of all this is going to be? That's my concern. For as far as the future state now, frankly, I don't think the future state should change what, from what the current state should theoretically be. You have to, what is a reasonable period of time to get a response? What is well, that, the fact is it varies depending on the application, the vendor, and things like that. Like just for example, you're not going to go ahead and expect, well, this is like, again, apples and oranges comparison for the most part. But if you have a flaw in the fundamental aspect of Microsoft Windows, which is embedded in all versions of Windows for the last decade, that's going to take a variety of regression testing, impact tests. Sorry, I'm speaking for you, but impact testing and everything like that. <laughs> On the other hand, if you have a fairly straightforward application, like, well, I don't, again, a fairly straightforward application these days is hard to come up with. Like but let's say, for ex let's say you have like a, a Cisco IOS vulnerability. It has less complex complexity than Microsoft Windows. I'm just using apples and oranges. But again, there's less, less complexity, and there should be a little bit of less regression testing albeit the fact that it does have to communicate with millions of computers all over the place. But there's, the problem is that we're, it's like a bunch of imbeciles can find these vulnerabilities and they expect the world to operate on their individual mindset. That's the problem that we're running into, where, oh, I want to do it now because, and frankly, even if it's not even their lack of patience most of the time, it's their desire for attention that would get it. They find a fundamental flaw, and it's like, wait a second, if they fix it, it's not newsworthy. And if they fix it, I'll get less attention. All I'll get is minor mention in like a technical note, as opposed to getting all the full disclosure that I see Dan Kaminsky getting or something like that. No offense. But, but the problem is, it's like I found vulnerabilities. I've worked with vendors that nobody's ever heard of before. And I don't necessarily think that's a bad thing. I don't care about the attention. The vulnerabilities have been fixed. The world's a better place, and I can live with that. But the problem is that you have other people that they just want the attention, or even if they w don't care as much about the attention, they want it on their mindset without having the complexity of dealing with product development and things like that, and knowing the aspects of regression testing, that it's got to be tested on 30 different languages simultaneously before you can implement a patch in all over the world. Anyway. Katie? Well, okay, so, I mean, you, you, you did cover a lot of, you know, the complexity issues, right? Um, and, and, you know, that absolutely has a lot to do with, you know, the ability for any vendor to come up with, you know, with a, a suitable, um, you know, way to address a vulnerability. But um, I think there's also, you know, there's also some, some I think, some uh, character, characterization of researcher motivations that, you know, it's a little bit more nuanced than that as well. Um, where I think it's not all, you know, not all of them are motivated by, you know, by the fame, right? So, and, and you were citing yourself. Yeah, you, you were saying, you know, you cited yourself as, as among those who's not, you know. But um, I think ultimately, you know, the, the, the industry, the original question you had, right, is how, where do we go from here, right? So uh, the original question, um, I would say that, you know, it is definitely time for us to all, uh, you know, take an assessment of each other in this, you know, in our, in our roles and disclosure and everything, and it's it's a it's a time for us to not um, polarize so much because we're not, you know, we're not all, uh, you know, definitely um, on one very, you know, extreme end of the spectrum or another. Or there's there's relatively few. I think it's much more of like a bell curve type of situation. And uh, as such, you know, we really need a way to sort of operate interfaith. You know what I mean? Like I said, that you know, it's a religious argument a lot of a lot of the times with with disclosure, and uh, we just we need a way to talk to each other, even when and especially when our disclosure philosophies are not completely in alignment. I mean, if if we all agreed, uh, you know, 100% across the board, uh, I'm pretty sure you know th that uh, that we'd have no debate, right? So that's the. Um, I mean, I think for us, it's it's a matter of making sure that we are participating, you know, as part of the community, you know, part of the security community, and that includes, you know, other vendors, that includes customers, that includes, you know, protection providers, and of course researchers. And we have a number of researchers of our own, um, you know, who participate in the vulnerability, you know, um, finding and and dis and disclosing, you know, to other vendors. So, anyway, I. 
you know, my point is uh, coordinated disclosure, you know, or whatever you want to call it, is it's about us being able to operate in this interfaith, you know, type environment that we live in. <coughs> yeah, uh, actually, I'm, I'm still, uh, I'm still kind of of two minds about this because on on one side, I agree. Uh, I mean, my my company has always done a responsible disclosure, so. Um, we, we, we do appreciate that vendors need time to properly fix things. On the other hand, um, some experiences uh, tell me that as soon as this becomes like an industry standard, uh, there's gonna be people that are going to kind of abuse it. Um, I'm talking about personal experiences, but we have been through um, the uh, threat of legal consequences about disclosing a cross-site scripting flaw into a, a web-based interface for uh, an open source forensic tool. And that leaves about two products. And so just, <laughs> just to rule out, it's not the one by Brian Carrier. So uh, this leaves just the one product. And, and this, you know, this made me think. It made me think because this was not a really high impact vulnerability. It was just something that we found during a penetration test. And basically, it could be reduced to very bad programming practices. A code monkey hired to program a specific part of the interface, not really understanding that if you are visualizing data that comes from a suspect hard drive, that data is considerably untrusted. So you should filter it before displaying it. And what were its consequences? Well, its consequences for that specific application were grievous because you could, basically a, a, a miscreant could construct files on his hard drive or even change something on his partitions in order to foil the visualization of any data on his, on, on his computer drive. So serious for the application, but nothing critical, nothing, no emergencies, no liabilities for the company, so it's not like if I go and disclose this bug, this company is going to suffer from a liability for that. So they, they trying to categorize. I'm trying to say that as as soon as you as soon as you imply, okay, this is the responsible way for doing disclosure. This is the the good way for doing disclosure. And if you do it any other way, you're go, you're bound to be liable in some way for the damage that you cause. This means that smaller pen testing firms or um, single users that are going to, yeah. to do vulnerability disclosure on, uh, on the side from their day job, they're going to be fearful about this. It's, it's just exactly what happens under the DMCA for the copyright protection mechanisms. Right. So yeah. is, it, is it sort of like uh, due diligence, right? If you put out there, I, I identified XYZ vulnerability or exploit that, you know, even if you're a small vendor, and it's kind of like, you know, you did your pen test and your vault testing, but you didn't do anything about it. You know your report was really bad, that you have all these holes to fix, and you're supposed to be abiding by SOX and PCI, and rut row, you get exposed, right? So now you're violating SOX and PCI. Because you knew you had vulnerabilities, but you didn't fix them, I'm trying to get address your, question, your statement here. Does that mean, I think, well, I'm trying to figure out what you said here. Does that mean if you're a smaller company and you found bugs and fixes, but you need more time to fix, where it's not that impactful or it is, are you liable for you know, legal activity, legal actions, because you're aware of it, but yet you can't address it? Is that what you're trying to say? I, I was seeing it from the other way around, but actually it works this way around as well. So, as a society, we want secure code. This is somewhat new. 1999, society couldn't care less. In 2003, a whole bunch of people's computers stopped working. And then society started caring. As a member of the software industry, I, and I think most people in the software industry, really, really do not want product liability legislation on computer software. People kind of bring it up, and then they think about it for about two seconds and realize, not naming names, but there are companies that ship databases today that if product liability existed, would not be able to ship again until the year 2023. So, <laughs> screeching brick wall gone. And just this industry destruction. 
So how do we resolve we have an absolutely strong need for secure code 